I want to be sure that you're familiar with the name Harrison Butker, field goal kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs, the Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs. But I want you to know that at Benedictine College in Asherson, Kansas, he kicked one right through the uprights with a graduation speech at that college. Graduation speech that has those who despise some of the values that he espoused calling for the Kansas City Chiefs to get rid of him, though he's one of the best kickers in the NFL. Just exactly what did he say that offended so many? He called out our president for being pro-abortion. By the way, if you want to read the entire speech, it's on the Internet in, in many places. Go read it. He also challenged LGBTQ craziness in our country and all of the intendant insanity that accompanies that movement in this nation. But it seems like they were most offended because he affirmed the value of having children and raising them to know the Lord. As if the real priority was to get the best job you can. You know, if you have the best job in the United States of America, whatever that is, and you don't pass on our faith to another generation, you have failed. doesn't have to be your own kids, but you need to be touching coming generations with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I bring that up today because it's so current. Uh, just in the last few days, that speech was made. And you know, they've been pillaring him in the media. I mean in print as well as in various television stations for the remarks he made. And by the way, I agree with everything he said. So they might as well pillory me too, but they don't know me, so they, <laughs> they leave me alone. But what I, what I want to tell you is that even though that's been happening, the number seven jersey that he wears when he plays for the Kansas City Chiefs, is flying off the shelves. They can't make them fast enough. People all over them, finally, they're talking about him and not that one that runs around with Taylor Swift. I won't even call his name right now. <laughs> you know? Now, you might think that I've just thrown my sermon away, but I haven't. Because, you see, my sermon is from generation to generation and one of the great ways that we pass truth from generation to generation is to be sure that the coming generations have our testimony and witness to who God is and what He has done. So I want to invite you to the 145th Psalm this morning. Psalm 145. And our key verse will be the fourth verse. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. According to the Westminster Catechism, our chief purpose in life is to love God and to enjoy Him forever. The 145th Psalm powerfully calls us to think deeply about who God is and what He's done. It challenges us in our selfishness. I want you to understand that all of the ungodly decisions that people make are made because they want to be their own God and they want to discount anything that God has commanded and do it their way. They want to be the final authority of what is right and wrong. But as we gaze on the glory of the Lord, as we truly encounter who God is, we come to realize that we must surrender our will to His will. Not my will, O Lord, but Thine be done. I've long loved 2 Corinthians 3.18, which reads, And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. The point is, as we gaze on the glory of the Lord, we become more like Him. Now, we got a ways to go, don't you? Don't you have a ways to go yet? But by gazing on the greatness and the glory of God, we can be changed. We can be made into bold men and women who honor God in our lives and who live in such a way that turns people's heads and causes them to wonder where we got the values and the vision that we have. Well, this 145th Psalm is very interesting. 
Do you realize that it is the last of the Psalms attributed to David? Now, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, David wrote the Psalms. Well, he didn't write all of them. Even within the text, you're told from time to time that other leaders also wrote some of the Psalms. They were songs of worship, inspired of the Holy Spirit, but songs of worship for the Hebrew people. But the 145th Psalm is the last of the Psalms of David, attributed to David. And it actually is not called a psalm by David. It is called a praise. It is a praise of David. Unmistakably, the entirety of the psalm is, is grander than the psalms in general in that it is asserting the glory and the wonder that is God. We need to recognize that from generation to generation, we must pass the torch of our faith in God, our understanding of who God is, and hold that torch high. Do you know that we're just one generation away from apostasy in our nation? If we miss one generation with the gospel of Christ, it will be devastating to the cause of Christ. I'm glad to report to you about a revival I read about this week that had over 1,600 professions of faith, had a massive baptismal service in the ocean, celebrating a, an amazing movement of God that happened among them. God is moving. But we must realize that our part is to be sure that we pass the torch to a coming generation. Do you know that every verse of the 144th Psalm begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet? There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and if you've looked ahead, you may have noticed there are only 21 verses. Well, that's not a mistake because the 13th verse contains two. And so there are 22 expressions in the psalm. It is what is called an acrostic psalm of praise to God. Well, J.B. Phillips wrote a book some years ago called Your God is Too Small. He was inevitably right. We struggle to understand fully the greatness of God. In fact, the Scripture says itself, Can you by searching find out God? Can you find out the Almighty under perfection? And the implied answer is no. But we can expand our understanding of who God is in Scripture and as we meditate on the greatness and the wonder of God. I want to invite you to the text and let's read some verses. Verse 1, I will extol you my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Notice that King David calls God the ultimate king. What does that mean? Whatever authority David had, it was nothing to be compared with the authority that God had over his life. I will bless your name forever and ever. Not only in the years of my life, but unto all eternity. Some would say, well, David, what did he really know about everlasting life? I think a good bit. The word forever means what it says, forever. And though our lives may be brief, and indeed they are, we will praise the Lord forever and ever. And David exclaims that in this opening. Every day I will bless you. And praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. You know, I read recently that if you can go outside and look on a clear night at the nighttime sky and the vast array of stars and the glorious Milky Way and the glory of the moon and meditate on the vastness of the universe and we know more about its vastness than David could possibly have known in his time. If you can look up into the heavens on a clear night into the stars and not be moved to praise God, then you're to be pitied more than a person who is blind. Because God is speaking to you through His creation. And if you're not listening, what a tragedy. 
So the glory of the natural wonders of the earth. You know, I was, I was checking to see how many species there are in the earth. Now, you know what makes a species? A species is any creature that can reproduce, okay? And do you know that there are more than a million species, some scientists say, in the earth? And we're still discovering several thousand species a year that we didn't know exist previously. The point quite simply is, God is not boring at all. The wonderful variety of creatures and and colors. God could have made the world black and white. But He chose to make it glorious. He wanted to speak to us through the created order. And indeed, He does. And David celebrates that. We are in a time when we spend so much time staring at the television and and chasing after things that are not worthy of our attention, that we're not hearing the message of the glory of creation as we should. But we ought to be hearing it and declaring it. We need to realize that a part of our gospel, the everlasting gospel, according to the book of Revelation, is the gospel of creation. Now, of course, the gospel of Jesus Christ must be declared, but always remember to share the gospel of the God who created the heavens and the earth. So our God is a great God. That's our point, first of all. I was thinking about God's greatness, and I thought about a verse I've come to love greatly. It's Deuteronomy 33, 25. It says, as your days, so shall your strength be. I shared on a Wednesday night that the words of that great hymn, Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. God's grace is revealed to us day by day. He is continually showing us His greatness. I've been saying lately as I've been battling health issues, I've been praying to God and saying, Oh God, I claim again that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Our body is amazing. Do you know that if we had only the details of DNA and the things we know about the human body, if that's all we had to look at, we should be moved to praise God that He has created us in His image. He is a great God. So let me say, listen well to the message of the Word. Listen well to the testimony of those who have experienced the greatness of God. Listen well to young and old as they share of what God continues to do. Experience it for yourself. Don't just hear about it. Have first-hand knowledge of God's greatness and pass it on. Pass it on. This passage of Scripture in the 145th Psalm also teaches us about the grace of God. Look at verse 8. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God Himself uttered those words recorded in Exodus 34 in an encounter with Moses. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. And His mercy is over all that He has made. The message here is not only that God is gracious toward those of us who trust Him. God is gracious to the evil. I mean, that's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 45, when He said, The sun rises on the evil and the good, and the rain falls on the just and the unjust. You know, out in West Texas, we used to say, if we could just get some rain on the just, we'd carry water to the unjust. (laughs) God blesses all kinds of people in all kinds of nations. In nations where there's only a minimal number of believers, God is still there. He is speaking through the glory of creation and showing forth His grace. Acts 14, 17, as Paul was preaching to the people of Lystra, who would later stone him. Kind of a terrible result for a sermon, I would think. But nevertheless, he said to them that God satisfies all people, even those who don't know him yet, with food and gladness. But the greatest expression of God's grace that David could only begin to imagine was when Jesus went to the cross. The Son of the living God died that we might have everlasting life. Listen well to the testimony 
of God's grace. His kindness and His mercy, how He has worked in the lives of people. Listen carefully to their testimony. Listen to the testimonies of the young, for they encourage us to realize that God is still at it. He's still blessing lives and changing them. Listen well. Experience it for yourself. And pass it on. You know, we experience God's grace so that we can express God's grace. And if you don't express grace, I'm not sure you've experienced it. Because those who have experienced grace have a hunger to express God's grace. Not just through what they say, but through how they live. You know what I see also in this passage of Scripture, of course, is the goodness of God. And the Scripture affirms that, and that relates well to the grace of God. But I see also the generosity of God. You say, well, where's that? Let's begin at verse 10. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds, the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Four times in those few verses, God's kingdom is mentioned. And I remind you that David bowed before the king of kings and recognized that nothing that he had accomplished had placed him in a position other than being subservient to Almighty God. So if you've gotten too big for God, you need to repent. You need to recognize that God is the ultimate king. Beginning in the middle of verse 13... We will hear the word all 11 times. Can I read it to you? The Lord is faithful in all His words and kind in all His works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all His ways and kind in all His works. The Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. Isn't that beautiful? The message is that God is generous in His goodness. And as I've already said, He is generous in His goodness to Not just to us who know Him, but to all. The Lord preserves all who love Him, but all the wicked He will destroy. Now that's not an all that is going to make its way to some kind of wall hanging or picture in your house. But it's there for a reason. Because even though God is merciful and loving and gracious and good, and great. He's also a God of judgment. And so David also records for us that he will destroy all the wicked, all who are twisted, all who have missed his message, all who have spurned his glory, all who have turned their backs on him, he will destroy. And then a beautiful closing. And and let me... Let me set this for you. I know we have things from David in in the Kings and in Chronicles, but so far as the Psalms are concerned, these are his last words. Do you get what I'm saying? This is the last Psalm that is a Psalm of David. The Lord will reign. My mouth will speak. I'm sorry, I got off my place. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name. Forever and ever. And so he continues. He ends this wonderful praise by declaring his intention to speak the praise of the Lord and desiring that all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. So we speak now of the glory of God. We need to recognize that This passage of Scripture is affirming not only the greatness of God and the grace of God and the generosity of God and the goodness of God, but it is affirming for us also the glory of God. 
It is speaking to us of the glory of His kingdom. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Long after every kingdom that the world has ever seen has crumbled into dust, God's content kingdom will continue. And you might say, well, exactly what is the kingdom of God? Let me give you Dallas Willard's definition. The kingdom is wherever what God wants done is done. And that's why Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. Because if you do the will of God, then the kingdom of God operates in and through your life. God is glorified by His kingdom that is unending. And those who live in His kingdom and live according to His rule. If you look back over your shoulder through this psalm, you'll see that we're challenged to praise Him from generation to generation. I know I've said that more than once, but I want you to get the message. What are you saying to the next generation about how valuable God is to you? Not only by what you say, but by what you do. Are you making a statement? It's a good question, is it not? Do you only make that statement in the cloister of your Bible study classes or your small group studies? Or would you make that statement of God's greatness and glory in a restaurant to a waiter? Or to a checker at Walmart? Or to a neighbor who had just moved into your neighborhood? Or to a neighbor that up to now you've never had a conversation with? Will you share the greatness of God in all of those places? For that's where it certainly is needed, though needed among us as well. This passage also tells us that we are to praise God from nation to nation. Every nation needs the gospel. You know what? I, I'm so glad I've been privileged to go to a number of countries. I preached in Cuba some years ago for a period of 10 days. And I must tell you that some of the most exciting worship services that I was ever in anywhere on earth were in Cuba. In a communist country. At that time, Fidel Castro was still alive. When I got up out of the chair on the platform to preach, a man slid into the chair behind me because he had been standing to my side. They had to open the doors to the street, and people stood in the streets. When I extended the invitation, I couldn't invite them forward. The aisles were packed with people standing to hear the gospel. And when I asked them just to raise their hand if they wanted to follow Jesus, people in the streets, including Cuban soldiers, were jumping up and down and waving their arms, wanting to be sure they were seen. As they were challenged to trust Jesus. I think we've had it too good in America. I want you to understand that God loves the nations of the earth. Yes, even those nations where Islam is the dominant religion. God loves those people and we must pray for them. Pray that they'll have dreams and visions. Pray that someone will share the truth of Jesus, even though it may be life-threatening to them. For He is to be praised from nation to nation. And notice David said, let every creature, literally, let every creature praise Him. St. Francis of Assisi had it right when he preached his sermon to the birds. You know, yesterday afternoon I was in my backyard and the birds were having a blast. They love this rain. There's so much food out there. They're so excited. I mean, we were having conversations and I could hardly talk for the birds. They were just whirring in the air and, and singing and praising. And I believe praising the Lord. I believe all creation praises God. It's just hard-headed human beings that fail to do so. All of God's creation should be praising the Lord from generation to generation, from nation to nation, from need to need. When things go wrong in your life, do you say, oh, why me, God? Or do you say, God, if you'll just walk with me through this, it'll be all right. Don't abandon me. Be with me, God. I praise you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. Walk with me. Until you gather me to yourself. From need to need. We ought to praise the Lord. And yes we can ask God to help us with our needs. But even if he does not. We need to be like Paul was. When he prayed that the Lord would remove a thorn from his flesh. 
And God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul went on to say, therefore I glory in my infirmities. It's kind of hard to glory in your infirmities. I have a few. But he said, I glory in my infirmities that the power of God may rest on me. From need to need and from prayer to prayer. You know, one time a graduating senior, not, not here in Georgetown even, but a graduating senior who was not a member of my church, but he knew me. He had bet me at some things I'd attended and we'd built a friendship. He called me and he said, I've got to uh, lead a prayer at the graduation. He said, it's traditional here for the valedictorian to lead a prayer at the beginning of the graduation. And he said, I wonder if you could coach me. And, uh, you know, help me think about how to pray. And I said, well, I'm not going to tell you what to pray, but let me give you an outline. A-C-T-S. A, adoration. Always begin your prayer adoring God, praising God, honoring God for all He is and for what He's done. C, confession. Acknowledge that you need Him. Acknowledge your need for forgiveness. Acknowledge that He's God and you're not. And that you want to humble yourself before Him in His presence. T. Thanksgiving. Always thank God as a part of your prayer. And S. Seek. Seek for yourselves and others. In other words, make your request for others. And I suggest even before you make requests for yourself. And the young man had written down ACTS, and when he rose to pray at his graduation, he followed the outline perfectly. I challenge you to keep that outline if you don't have it already. We are to praise God from prayer to prayer. 